Hello and welcome back to the channel. Bit of a new look. Uh, decided to take a bit of a leap, especially after this comment yesterday. And uh, get myself out there a bit more and uh, yeah, start reacting to some stuff to camera. I mean, this guy in the comments seemed to think I was in some kind of noteworthy band back in the day. But I was just in a local band that lasted about 13 gigs and hung around with the Paddingtons a bit. So let's crack on with this video, shall we? So yeah, I was going to do a bit of a deep dive on Julian Casablancas' recent interviews. And then I saw that Strokes Archive on Instagram, great account, by the way, well worth a follow, uh, had done the job for me, basically, and compiled 20 clips of recent interviews with the, kind of the best bits, I think. So let's have a look. First one is the making of Like All Before You. We're in a kind of big studio environment, which was different for us. And um, I thought interesting to hear us, like, you know, Flexorcist and Prophecy are probably like the two kind of obvious, yeah. kind of bigger sounding songs, I guess. So that's how we began. And then, you know, we had eight songs to hand in for this deal. I suppose that's quite interesting after the strokes recorded with Rick Rubin. Maybe the big studio vibe is a thing now. We, we we had so we were working on these songs and the pandemic happened and then so everything kind of got lost and floated and then I kind of figured out I like to record at Amir's in his garage at his home studio better our guitarists like the and so we just kind of what would he say they're better better yeah it's interesting that though because I always felt that um pre-pandemic I always thought his focus was on the strokes like they were doing quite small gigs, doing back to doing normal tours again. So I always thought that the pandemic threw the strokes off rather than threw the voids off, but interesting. And I worked on it there to finish it and hone it in, but we had elements of this kind of mega studio recording and also just, you know, time to make it sound like whatever we wanted. So, yeah, I don't know. It's like a cyborg half kind of <laughs> big album, like never mind vibes and then home studio half you know whatever just kind of yeah we... okay so it was a half and a half thing don't know if you can really tell that on the album to be fair i mean i do i definitely like some of the album i think it's some of it's a grower i know that needle drop guy on youtube absolutely panned it he said there was no good songs on it which i can't agree with that flex assist and the special analysis are, are like top draw for me and I probably think I'll probably get into the rest of the album as I listen to it some more. What are your favourites, sir? <laughs> Have yours say in the comments. Next one, The Strokes versus The Voids. Done a video on this myself. This will be interesting. Matt Wilkinson here of Apple Music, friend of the pod, interviewing. On my own. Those demos I did all by myself, they sound very close to the record. Yeah. And so, and then The Void sometimes, a lot of it is just now stuff that my dream has always been to just work on like kind of harmony melody and then kind of someone else writing the drum this outfit's pretty impressive isn't it it's like <laughs> it's got his wacky shirt on and a leather waistcoat short sleeves going on and some kind of some Beats, kind of jewelry going on there because someone should yeah, be better at the thing. drums than i am you know what i mean type of vibe and yeah. someone else kind of doing kind of complicated chord structure i can do that i do both but the irony is that people the weird thing that i feel the frustration that you're feeling is not like in the reality of doing both it's it's in the perception that like that i'm always fighting that it feels like almost like the voids is like me alone and the strokes was like me filtered through other people when it's kind of the other way around on my own, those demos. So that's quite interesting. He's saying it's more of a collaboration, is he, with the voids, rather than just what he thinks goes, which is quite interesting. Seems to be more of a, I don't know, just seems to be more of like a healthy dynamic in the voids, but I don't know what I'm basing that on. I guess it's uh, the side project thing is always going to be like more fun from. Don't really think. The strokes is uh, where the fun is at for Julian anymore, is it? I don't know. Let's go to the one on Julian on politics. This stuff quite it's interesting funny with Julian because, uh, yeah, I feel like that's his passion kind of thing as well. I feel like when the strokes came back for the for the most recent album, 
I felt like politics was really driving it. They were doing gigs for like Bernie Sanders uh, convention, would you call it? And for other kind of politicians. And I felt like that was how Julian was channeling his energy into the strokes. It kind of gave him a reason for doing it more, I thought. But that seems to have dropped off recently, but see what I have to say about contemporary politics. Because a lot of people don't know, lyrically, you've always had this strong passion about politics. And I think in a way, also people don't know if you listen to a song like New York City Cops, I think now people know because you've done a few interviews about it, but you've always had this interest, right? It's always been a passion of yours. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I, not interested in, I don't really pay attention to any kind of mainstream pol news, corporate media, mainstream news source, or, uh, you know, bribed politicians, which are, you know, all of them basically. <laughs> yeah. We know the world's on fire. That much we know. I mean, I just don't, it's, I'm just not interested. It's just the solution will be outside or around that which everyone is kind of hypnotized by and likes to talk about it's funny because a lot of people don't know lyrically so he's saying doesn't really believe in either party for the uh, upcoming american election more underground any fair play to him <laughs> um this guy that's trying to say politics has been in the strokes lyrics for uh or julian's lyrics for ages with new york city cops i guess it has i don't know um feels like there is quite a few political themes on the latest voids album though particularly things like spectral analysis but make that what you will julian's presence on stage back to apple music the voids you are very relaxed like i've never seen a void show or seen footage of a void show where it, you have seemed tense particularly i think that's an act but cool. really i guess maybe in some ways it's where i want to be but i think you're always kind of just you have to i mean some natural performers i'm sure you know i've heard you know some people i'm just i feel natural on stage that's not me well you know you're being judged it's hard to just even walking across the stage at, you know yeah man i can understand that well i'm just saying the analogy for just walking you know we all you don't you walk down the street you don't think about it but you're walking on stage and you're like the legs in my muscles i don't it's like i've never done this before and there's like that element in general i feel like with the voids you are yeah that's interesting i mean I I saw the Voids play in Birmingham a few years ago now, and I'm pretty sure they cut the gig early because some guy was going wild on the front row, like the Mandy Stroke songs. I could have read that wrong. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd say Julian does seem pretty relaxed on stage, even with the Strokes now, though. The Strokes shows at festivals just seem like an absolute laugh to him. <laughs> Don't really seem to take him seriously. But yeah, I'm definitely more intrigued to see the voids now than the strokes, I think. Next one, Julian on the Doors. I kind of got into music later. It was like 13, yeah. 14. My stepdad gave me a tape, Best of the Doors. Yeah, that was the first. I, I still think as a band, because, you know, there's some artists that you wanted to talk about and stuff, but just if I had to pick a band, and I was just listening to it the other day, you know, played out, songs because i you know, listen to it so much like la woman or something and just yeah. how that song just every single riff and drum beat and keyboard and the back and forth even though jim morrison is this you know guy and his lyrics and voice and all that is is insane and amazing and, and i'm a super fan it's really like uh, they're like a super team and so as a band i think they're one of the best and they work you know just decades ahead of their time in many ways and you know jazzy but also very like with the trends of their time. So I think people didn't even realize how kind of iconic they were going to be. Maybe, I mean, maybe some did. Well, I don't know how to anything about the doors. So that's interesting. I'll have to visit that song you mentioned there. Next Julian on the clash. Um, tell me about strokes, uh, deciding to cover the clash and tell me about your relationship with, uh, with this band and as a fan. Yeah. So is this reference to, um, when the strokes are playing clamp down, I think some good live recordings of that actually. Um, fan of the song. Um, we were doing it live for a while. Um, 
I had met Joe Strummer. And what was that experience like? I mean, it was just after. It was like a loud bar, awkward. Yeah. Was this there a lot awkward. of craziness that night, too? Because we had... We I think all... it was a troubadour. Yeah. Uh, there's like a photo of it. I don't think I would remember it if I didn't see the photo, honestly. <laughs> I had those nights. Uh, <laughs> Many of them, which is why I'm sober four years now. This is always awkward when you meet, you know, someone that you're just like, okay, I, I don't know how to... Like, where, I don't know. Where do you begin? Um... Where did you first become like um, familiar with the Clash? Um, Honestly, as a young child, um, tell me about story. Kind of quick shot there. I do remember Fab saying about <laughs> yeah, he didn't know who Joe Strummer was. So this guy, he's like, oh, this guy came up to me after the show and said, "Well, then I was like, I oh, cheers, man." And it ended up being Joe Strummer, but then I don't think he's rude to him or anything. But it's quite funny. Making you have music. to have an instrument in your hand in order for that to happen, or can it just be there in your head at any given point? I get ideas all the time. They can happen without uh, an instrument, but generally developing the harmonic structure of things and is, is with an instrument. So I think traditionally I would write with an instrument, but... Over the years, it just, you know, sometimes you, you, a couple of times I've, I've had a dream where, you know, sometimes they can be wonderful. And sometimes I've had dreams like that where it's like, wow, this guy came to me or maybe it was some other famous person or like, you know, someone that I was a fan of that, you know, played a song in my dream. And I would wake up and think, wow, that was a cool song. And I'd be like, oh, wait, wait a second. That doesn't exist. I just I made it up. So you kind of like ripping off songs from your own dreams you have to have an instrument that's pretty interesting it sounds like an idea for its song itself i've had that <laughs> i feel like i've had that myself a few times but i remember like ricky gervais saying uh there'll be jokes in your dreams sometimes that you'll find hilarious while you're asleep but then you wake up and they're rubbish whereas songs i found that i can't remember songs that i've come up with in my <laughs> in my dreams but yeah I'm not doing Casablanca, so it's not really a problem. Warren Fu. And then this is Instant Crush. Interesting. He was working with Daft Punk, and he put us together. I mean, do you remember writing? Did you first, The first tracks that you got, did that, is that what ultimately became that song, or was it at a different shape initially? Um, they played me two songs. They played me um, what ended up being the verse of instant crush and then they ended up and they showed me the chorus and they were kind of like showing them as two separate songs like if i liked one or preferred one and so yeah i i just i thought they would work together and i like to do that a lot i think that's a songwriting thing i have always done even on the first strokes record i think i would i'd be writing a song and i'd be writing one part that had a vibe and then another part that maybe had a totally different vibe and I would just kind of put them together. Yeah. Warren Fu. That's another interesting little insight there. Didn't know that. I can ask pretty hard to do, but I guess that's uh, the genius of it. Me and Lou Reed next. Did you meet Lou later on? We did an interview with him once, but you know, it was the whole band. We also did a song with him and we did Walk in the Wild Side. And so I've, you know, I'd done, I'd like, you know, seen him a little bit and he was, you know, he was, it was great. I think I was so, you know, honored and humbled and looked up to him. So I think he, I think he was, you know, I think it's like, if you recognize his genius, he's like, cool with you. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I wasn't trying to kiss his ass. I, I genuinely like see it as the truth. So I would, like I was saying, I think we could do it. We could do a show on the Velvet Underground too. Yeah. I mean, cause there's, there's such a, they touch so many things. They do like the fifties thing. They kind of have like a, even like the sixties, I'd call it now like Wes Anderson music thing. And even into the deep into his career, you know, like walk on the wild side and yeah, I guess that's interesting. Not only really much to add to that, obviously. Uh, player inspiration for the Strokes was, was Lou Reed and Julian's radio role. This should be interesting. I actually think the main way is um, I listen to FM radio below 92. That is my main rule in life. Mm. I don't have many rules. 
That's like 88.9. I mean, if you go above 92, it's going to suck. It's, like, it's commercial radio. <laughs> yeah. It's usually, there's one exception, the Venice Low Power Station, mm -hmm. 99.1. I liked K-Rock growing up, but I know that's 106, so that doesn't, it was commercial, obviously, but. Too high. Too high. <laughs> you got to go lower. Can't go below 92, I'm sorry. And not, and not AM radio. I mean, if you want to go really indie, I guess you could have gone AM radio. There are AM stations that are cool, but, um. That's just that's just like maybe one layer, one level of too complicated, pain in the ass to to go. But <laughs> I love that rule. Uh, yeah, no, it's great. I mean, just th there's so many great curators of you know collect cool old genres. I constantly discover not only new music but new like genres. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a reference to American radio. Obviously, don't really know, not really too familiar with that. So, but it's clearly not a talk sport fan anyway. So, I'll try anything once. Is next. Well, tell me about the two versions of the song. Explain to everybody because it's a really cool story about how uh, you, you know, like you had extra lyrics, right? Yeah. I mean, so that was the live version, but the more known or whatever, you know, uh, the B side, I'll Try Anything Once, is considered to be like the original demo, but it was actually done afterwards because we needed a B side and I had all these extra lyrics for the song that I didn't use that I thought was cool. Because I had this kind of longer story thing in mind, but, you know, we're making pop records here. <laughs> and so I just kind of, uh, it got shortened, and, and so, uh, yeah. So I just did a fake demo, so it was a lie. I'm yeah. living a lie. But it was I'm really here to confess. <laughs> well, tell me about... That's really interesting. Never knew that. Definitely always thought I'll try anything once as a, a demo for you'll, for you'll only live once. So yeah, that's pretty cool info. Both great songs. I always thought they should kind of mold for a for a live performance, like start off with I'll try anything once type vibe with Julian just singing with a piano. Or however they do it. And then when they reach the first and I'll get along with you, but the whole band kicks in. Anyway, that's a bit of a detour. Is this it album art change? Okay. Tell me about that. I just it was just a cool image that we wanted to use or that I thought was cool and wanted to use for the image, for the cover, because it was like this kind of big bang science project, you know, like a particle accelerator image that looked so, looked like a painting. Yeah, almost a Pollock-like in some ways, you know what I mean? I, I love, didn't I love the Stone Roses covers before that, you know, things they would do. I wouldn't compare it exactly like that, but I just thought it was cool because it was... It could leave anything to the imagination at that period of time. Yeah, I think, I think for us, I, at least for me, <laughs> releasing something in England didn't feel almost as real or something. So yeah. the cover was kind of, it was fine, but it was just kind of, uh, I think wanting to do it different in the U.S. was always on my mind. So people thought it was too controversial to have an ass, which <laughs> I think is, is fine. Tell me about that. Right, I didn't know that. Well, I knew they had two different covers. Can't work out if Julian prefers the original cover or the American cover there for Is This It, but that's interesting again. Quite topical as well, because we recently saw this on Simpsons album, on the Simpsons album Twitter account, and it's gone down a storm on Instagram. It's pretty funny. Pretty, it's mad how accurate some of them are, actually. Would recommend following it. Last night music video. Uh, last night, let's talk about this. Julian, what was it like the first time you like saw your 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 video on on the air? I mean, because I remember the video was so cool and the way you guys shot it. And can you tell me a little bit about that, the, that shooting that video in that like almost like boxing ring thing that you guys had done? I think I just had like a dream maybe, and I drew a thing, and then they. Uh, I, I, okay, so I didn't. I was slightly anti-video in a way. Um, I didn't want to. I felt like videos really changed the way you digest a song or think of a song. And so I wanted to do like a live version of it. So actually the video is the live version of the song. It's not the actual album version. Yeah. Kind of did the same thing with Human Sadness, Void Song too. Yeah. Where it's like the video is not the album thing. You just do it live. Um, so that the video and the album song kind of have their own thing. Uh, last night, let's talk about this. Not really any juicy info there. It's a good video, though. I only realized later on that it was actually a live version. 
which is uh, slightly embarrassing. Flex is his video. Here we go. One of the best songs on the album for sure. Um, it's just a very funny, like super jacked. Yeah. And, um... and he's like cynical. I think this is the talk about when Mike DeMarco is playing the devil in this video. Well worth a watch if you haven't seen it. Really? Yeah, it's just a really great character in Legend. It's the best part of Legend by yeah. far. And um, his lines are just so iconic. So I always thought, you know, that there's also different sketch comedy ideas where people trying to sell their soul to the devil for success. And, you know, like uh, there's like a Will Ferrell. Yeah, I've uh, seen some of them. Devil, devil can't write no love yeah. song or whatever, <laughs> like a sketch he did with, I think, Garth Brooks. Yeah. Um, and so it was just that kind of idea. And I thought, you know, Jim Morrison could be like his pal hanging out with him. And I never thought it would be me or, you know, <laughs> I thought it would be professional comedians, but no one ever wanted to do the idea or it never happened. So then one day we were just like, let's just, how about we just do it ourselves? Because yeah. it's, if not, it's never going to get made. So. What's the Julian's Christmas song? Assume this is I uh, wish it was Christmas today. How many times I've told you that you have uh, one of my favorite Christmas songs of all time with Christmas tree? I know you laugh, but we were like, very, I'm like, dude, your Christmas song, Julian. I love that. I pull it out every year, Horatio no matter where Sands I am. and Jimmy Fallon, uh, they wrote the song. <laughs> did they? They really did? Well, yeah, it's, a, it's a SNL. You know, you're... I had no idea. I did that. Uh, <laughs> I did the Ass Cat thing with a. Uh, a Bright Citizens Brigade in New York City and Horatio yeah. Sands and those guys were all on it and they were all doing skits. I was like telling stories and they were, mm. they were doing skits around my stories mm. and uh, I had no idea he did that. Yeah, That's really cool. That's great. Yeah, see, I think I did know that, but it makes sense now because I remember Julian played in London uh, 2014 with uh, The Voids and it was, the, it was December time, so I think everyone was expecting him to play that song. <laughs> And they didn't play it. Kind of makes more sense now the fact that he didn't write it, but he's still, come on, Julian, just play it. It's Christmas, right? Right. Next one's called Sushi Seki. No idea about this one. I was at Sushi Seki next oh, to you and your wow. dad years ago. And I and I I had a relationship with your dad for years. We were friends and um his company he started was my business partner when I started my company for oh, many wow. years. So it's this weird thing, you know? Oh, that's so I'm crazy. like the Kevin Bacon of uh, or something. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. You kinda have a Kevin Bacon vibe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, no, that's funny. It's, we were I was trying to get him to I guess like sushi. We were at yeah, I think. Sushi Seki, which is my favorite sushi place in the whole world. Well, he was at like Sloan Kettering, uh, Sloan, Ke what's the second word? Kettering, Ke I think. Kettering, yeah. yeah. That was, was around the time when, his... he, yeah, I think that was at the, right? That was, that was like, when, how long ago? Yeah, I that? remember I took him there and that was, that's funny that you were there. Yeah, I just didn't, I don't like to interrupt people. I mean, I never go up to people unless I'm like properly introduced and I knew your dad, but I don't like to just, it's funny, this weekend I was at a table next I'm to sure Paul I'm sure he would have loved it. Well, he, we knew each other, but it's yeah. funny, we had this, this uh, we, had, we had a great relationship for a couple of years, um, but he was a great guy. I was at Sushi Seki next oh. So Sushi Seki is a restaurant then apparently. And this guy knows Julian Casablanca's his dad. So interesting one. It's a good document. I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but there's a documentary about Julian's dad if uh, that piques the interest. Oh, but here it is. Prophecy of the Dragon, obviously a song on the new album. It is. This is New Voids, and this song is called Prophecy of the Dragon. It's Julian Casablanca's in the studio Prophecy. with me today. Prophecy. What did I say? No, no, I'm just, I was just saying it oh. with, with a silly voice. Okay. <laughs> prophecy. For a minute, I say, prophecy. Of the dragon. No, yeah. It, it, it sounds like a character there. Let's <laughs> check it out right now. The voids. That's so cool sound. Oh, but here. We have a bit of banter there to finish off, and then more void shows as the last clip. I, on these void shows, how many, I know you're doing the Apollo in New York, and you're playing the 16th. Um, are are there going to be more shows after that? Are you guys going to go overseas? What, what what's happening? I'm not sure. Boys? We just kind of had a, yeah three shows, three or four shows booked, and uh, we're trying to do a residency in New York, like a kind of there's this club. It, it hasn't opened up yet, but it's it was like an old underground kind of jazz club in the twenties, from the twenties to the fifties. You ever Club Eighty Two? You ever heard of that? Yeah, place? yeah. Um, anyway, so we're maybe going to do that if that opens up and, uh, that was kind of, but it'd be cool to have you on the one books. out here too. It'd be great if you did one on each coast. Yeah, we might be doing, you know, we might be doing a secret warm up thing, but yeah. 
Um, no, I think we're just going to do these shows and then kind of, I think, yeah, go from there. I, on these Void shows, how many? I know you. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I think I've done a few residencies before. Um, get the impression he's not that bothered about playing in England. I'm not sure if he. Uh... Then I remember he, a Strokes gig in uh, Victoria Park. He described the. <laughs> He described the crowd as like a pack of dogs. So I'm not sure he likes our vibe that much, but I might be wrong. But yeah, it'd be great to see him over here. So yeah, that's the first type one of these videos, probably. <laughs> not exactly uh, peak YouTube, is it? But thought I'd give it a go. What do you make of it? What do you make of what Julian had to say there? Any interesting points? Anything that you didn't know before? Definitely a few things I didn't know before. But yeah, I might have to go back and actually listen to the full full interviews now. But yeah, do you want to see more of these videos, reaction type videos? Hopefully be worthwhile and I won't just get rinsed by my mates. But, but yeah, I did want to say thanks for uh, supporting the channel anyway. Nearly reached 3,000 subscribers now, which is great for me, really. It's quite a niche topic on here. So I appreciate that small time numbers for, for some people, but pretty happy with that myself. So yeah, hopefully be back with another one of these soon.